forget all you know about podcasts. We welcome you to an experience uniquely different. Please join us for our coverage of all entertainment on the fringe of society. The candles are lit. The lights are down low. It is now time for our host. As he steps up to the pulpit, the sacrifice has been prepared for the midnight black. Ghastly greetings, groovy ghoulies, and welcome to another edition of the Midnight Black Mass. I am back in the saddle again. I'm back in the saddle again. That's right. A little bit of uh, scheduling difficulties, and they actually persist, but, you know, being the maniacal minister of the occult that I am, the Reverend Dan Wilson, I will find a way around them. So all that means is that our on-demand date for the Midnight Black Mass will be changing. We have been getting up on Thursday evenings now, looking like Friday or Saturday, but still going with the weekly format. That hasn't changed. If you subscribe to us on Stitcher or iTunes under the Potty Humor banner, you already have in your possession last week's episode, which was episode 13, a special flashback to 2011, an interview with, before they were stars, if you will, an interview that we did with current WWE NXT star Dash Wilder back when he was known as a little old Stephen Walters. And uh, it was quite an entertaining interview. But tonight, I got the goods for you. I'm bringing the straight dope right here to the Midnight Black Mass on these podcast interviews. Tonight, our guest is Andrew Alexander. Some of you might know him. If you do, then you already know what to expect. If you don't, Buckle up. We're going to have him as part one of a two-part interview. He's one of, in my opinion, the unsung heroes of independent wrestling over the last decade. A guy who I consider to be extremely intelligent about the business. A guy that will shoot straight. And let me tell you, he holds nothing back. And and when we get into part two, he's even going to hold less back. That's our guest tonight, Mr. Andrew Alexander. So where can you find me? Well, this Sunday at 3 p.m. in Red Bank, Tennessee at the TWE Arena, I will be appearing for the AIWF National Wrestling Showcase, telling from 36 promotions nationwide, coming from coast to coast, going to be talent from all over. Really looking forward to this event. I'll be providing the play-by-play commentary. Returning to the old seat is Dan the Dragon. Looking forward to that. I've been doing more of that than managing lately. So it's interesting how the career comes full circle. Uh, And I'm totally fine with that. But, you know, I do like getting out there at ringside and causing a ruckus. Unfortunately, I've stuck around so damn long. They all love me. And and I liked it a lot better when they hated me. But we can, we'll, we'll get there again someday, I'm sure. You're going to have to run me off. In one capacity or another, I'll be sticking around. Even if it's just here close to home, you never know when you're going to see the Reverend. Uh, But, of course, with Empire Wrestling, and Andrew Alexander is going to talk a lot about Empire Wrestling, as he is the matchmaker there and the the current booker. But uh, I will be appearing there when they return to the Empire Arena. That will be next Saturday night on November the 1st. And the Chasing the Grail tournament just ended. Joey Lynch became the number one contender to the Empire Heavyweight Championship. The long-reigning champion, Sean Tempers, going now into his 10th month as the Empire Heavyweight Champion. On November the 1st, he will defend the title or against Joey Lynch as, uh, as things are moving along and progressing at Empire Wrestling in Rossville, Georgia. You can find them online at Facebook.com. Slash Empire Wrestling on Twitter at Empire PW and at their website at Empire Wrestling.net where they have the exclusive Empire TV with exclusive video on demand content, more commentary from the dragon. I'm there and uh, 
loving doing the play by play. There are a lot of great talent, a lot of uh, great matches up there. The whole card from Crazy from the Heat 2014 is up there. Recent card uh, matches from the D1 Sports Complex and other matches from the Empire Arena in Rossville, all available for you to view on video on demand at EmpireWrestling.net. And, of course, I will be appearing at the Empire Wrestling booth at the Superstars of Wrestling Fan Fest, Saturday, November the 15th. That's all day long at the Forum in Rome, Georgia. You can find them online at SuperstarsFanFest.com. Stars like Jim Cornette, Jake the Snake, Robert Taxaw, Jim Duggan, Jim the Anvil, Nineheart, and a whole host of others will be appearing at that event. It's a Legends convention, plus there will be matches that night and actually all day. Uh, really going to be a treat to be a part of the Superstars of Wrestling Fan Fest in Rome, Georgia on November the 15th. Check them out the night before. I've heard there's still a few seats left for Mick Foley, who will be in town doing one of his stand-up comedy specials. They're in Rome, Georgia at the Brew House. You can find out more info about that also at superstarsfanfest.com. So, as we move into the Halloween season, I'm excited to have one of my former rejects on the program. He's going to usher us into Halloween. Been taking in a plethora of horror films. I talked about that last week. That's continued. Still loving American Horror Story. They are really cranking out a masterpiece in this season. I, I mean, I've seen some friends that don't necessarily think that. Um, but the show is very odd. It took me a while to warm up to it. So I, it certainly wasn't a show that I immediately loved. I liked it okay. But after going back and watching that second season, like I'd said before, it really opened my eyes to what they were doing there. And I thought it was kind of unique. And I think they're really transcending what they're capable of with this freak show season, especially with the character of Twisty the Clown, who's one of the most horrific monster clowns. Uh, he really ranks right up there with it and Captain Spaulding and John Wayne Gacy in real life, of, of course, and the Joker and, and all of the other famous murdering clowns. I think uh, <laughs> Twisty is going to join that echelon of horror icons if they continue the current path of creepiness with that character this season on American Horror Story. So, time for the Rev's rant. What am I going to rant about this week? Well, I'm going to get on a little bit of a soapbox. I just celebrated my fourth wedding anniversary. Very happy about that. My second marriage, my first one was colossally bad. And that's not just sour grapes. Uh, I've never truly, I don't think any of my exes I would ever consider evil or bad people except for my first wife and um who boy it, it was just the example of what a bad marriage could be so when you have a good marriage and you got a partner that's like your tag team partner and they're right there with you and they like the shit that you like and they share your interests and they share your goals and they support you as opposed to tearing you down um it's really a different situation and, and I'm really appreciative of it but unfortunately in the Rev's rant this week for young guys, I do want to talk about how a relationship can poison your wrestling career. Bad decisions early on. You're a young man, of course. You have an opportunity to make plenty of mistakes. You're a young woman, even to the female wrestlers that may be listening. You have opportunities to make mistakes in life. That's what living is about, man. Especially your 20s, it's rife with mistakes. Trust me, no one's going to avoid those pitfalls. But you should be very careful of how you approach relationships because toxic relationships kill more wrestling careers than injuries than any other. I God, I've seen so many talented guys who had the world going for them and got into a bad situation. And, and you would say, well, if they, had, if they really had the passion for it, they wouldn't let that happen. And I have to say that's not necessarily true because I saw guys that had the passion for it. I saw guys that were out making every town and, and just defeating all 
of their obstacles, and then they get locked into this poisonous relationship, and their partner is very, very protective of them going out on the shows. They're jealous. They don't have security in their relationship, so they're afraid they're going to be out there fooling around on them on the road, and then they get very controlling and manipulative, and they keep you at home, and then you're making excuses as to why you're canceling bookings. Oh, my car broke down. Oh, my uh, my fucking dog ate uh, some Drano and got sick, so I got to take him to the vet. Um, whatever your excuse might be, that you're not going to make it to the event that night when really what's going on at home is your old lady's like, Oh, are you going to another wrestling show again? Are you kidding me? You haven't spent a weekend with me in four months. Every weekend, all you care about is wrestling. You're always on the road 24-7. When are you going to give some time to me? Well, guy either says, tough shit, this is what I'm going to do in my life, or says, oh, sorry, baby. And, you know, women could dig them claws in deep. And I'm sure, you know, and not to be sexist, because I'm sure it works exactly the same way. When you develop strong feelings for someone, whether a man or a woman, um, you know, you're you're hooked in on an emotional level. And if you're not careful, you can really get sucked in. And I've seen so many guys fall victim to that. And hey, I mean, I'm not trying to tell anybody how to live their life. Make your own decisions. I mean, if that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. Maybe maybe dealing with that is better than wrestling or what you might have gotten out of it. You know, the risk versus reward scenario in the wrestling business, it's a pretty high risk for a pretty little reward. But still, that's what you want to do. You want to pursue that woman? Pursue that dude? Go for it. However... When it blows up in your face, you say, well, I've always got wrestling, and you do. That's the great thing about it, is it's always there, but you don't always have opportunity. The window of space and time magic can open and close very quickly. Sometimes it's all about the timing. And sometimes if you don't jump on things right when the window of opportunity is open, The window of opportunity closes. So, yes, wrestling is still there. But are the same opportunities? Are the same spots? The same level of respect? Is that always available? Certainly depends on your level of talent in a lot of cases. I've seen that certainly hold true. Not saying it's right, but saying it happens. But in most cases, by and large, no, you would not. You would lose your momentum. So just something to think about on the Rev's rant this week, ladies and gentlemen. I have had a great week, couple of weeks off. I would be in remiss if I didn't mention during the time that we've uh, given you sort of the limited edition here that uh, we lost three greats in professional wrestling. So I just want to take a moment to send appreciation to what the men had done, what they've done for our industry. And what I'm talking about is, of course, Mr. Ox Baker, the master of the heart punch, one of the most heinous heels in all of professional wrestling. He was a big, bad son of a gun, and he looked like he could hurt somebody. He didn't have a six-pack of abs and look like a male model. That seems to be the going perception of, um, of what a professional wrestler is supposed to look like. And as Andrew Alexander will talk about later in this interview, I have no, like, I'm not trying to insult what those guys do at all. I could never put in the time and dedication it takes in the gym to look like that. That's why I chose a non-wrestling role. <laughs> so, um... I, I just, I have nothing but the utmost respect for guys who can have the six pack of abs and look like a male model, but there is a strong lack of believable looking badasses, tough guys, wild men in professional wrestling. And the ones they do have, they don't protect very well. So Ox Baker, he came from a whole different generation in respect to that. Ox Baker was the textbook definition 
of a badass heel. See, Jim Cornette posted on Twitter uh, a legendary riot from Ox Baker, uh, and just it's one of the the greatest wrestling riots ever caught on film, is how it was described. And uh, I retweeted that, so follow me on Dragons Rejects or at Dragons Rejects on Twitter and check out that video clip. If you want to get an example of what I'm talking about, what the great Ox Baker was capable of. We also lost Dr. Ken Ramey, the manager of the legendary Masked Interns, who had a huge run up here in my neck of the woods in the Tennessee area. They were big stars for the Goulas territory. And uh, Dr. Ken Ramey, one of the greatest managers of all time that you probably never heard of, is what Dave Meltzer said in the Wrestling Observer. And i that's probably a fair statement, especially if you didn't live here in the South. But, I mean, I'm thinking Ramey, and I haven't looked it up because I didn't prepare. But uh, I, I'm thinking, what, the 60s, the 50s and 60s is probably when the interns had their biggest run. Maybe, Maybe I'm off on that. Maybe it was the 70s. Uh, but they're still remembered here. They're one of those acts that the old timers, when they talk about wrestling, they don't talk about John Cena. They don't talk about the Undertaker. They don't talk about WWE in Chattanooga. When you ask the old timers about wrestling, the interns, Ken Ramey, Jackie Fargo, Nick Goulas, Gypsy Joe, Tojo Yamamoto, Bobby Eaton. Those are the names that come up because the Chattanooga wrestling was very prominent here compared to the other territories. Chattanooga was just very tiny little dumpy territory, but um, for the people that lived here, it was something very special and it still resonates. I remember in the NWA Chattanooga days when I was out on the town talking to people and trying to do some, some homegrown promoting, um, you know, that that's always the, the names that would come up. So Dr. Ken Ramey's presence still felt to this day. And uh, just, I hate that there's not enough footage of those guys. There's so little footage of guys from that era. Uh, of course, the TV shows, you know, they used to tape over the TV every week. So it, they would not maintain what would now be a gold mine of a library. There's only limited stuff out there. And that's a real shame. But rest in peace, Dr. Ken Ramey. And then uh, the last week before the last week's show, and I failed to mention it, Cowboy Bob Kelly. A man who's been heavily involved in the Gulf Coast Wrestling Reunion. I believe he was the guy over the whole thing for many, many years. A dear friend of all of the old timers. I, I don't know that I ever got to meet the Cowboy myself. Um, if I did, I, I don't recall it. I've been to a lot of these these conventions and things. So, um, you know, you, you get to meet guys. And, and I'm certainly a historian. And I usually remember most of the encounters I have. But... The older I get, the uh, I'm paying for my 20s a little bit, so my memory is not the best sometimes. But uh, so, but, but nothing but respect to those legends and those veterans. And I urge you young guys to look up the history, to learn the history of your business, because history is always doomed to repeat itself one way or the other. All right, we're going to go to commercial. We'll be back right after this with our guest this week, Mr. Andrew Alexander. Don't go anywhere. Tonight, Black Matt says, please to announce we have become an affiliate of the World Wrestling Network at www.nlive.com, the home of the finest eye pay per view and video on demand in all of professional wrestling, featuring promotions like Dragon Gate USA, Evolve, Combat Zone Wrestling, OVW, Shimmer, Shine, $5 Wrestling. And the Vaunted Kayfabe Commentaries with their You Shoot, their Guest Booker, and their Timeline Series. You have to check it out. Of course, you can always go to their main page at www.nlive.com. But if you will, do us a solid. Go to facebook.com slash pottyhumor or follow me on Twitter at Dragons Rejects. We'll be posting our own unique links to these events as affiliates. If you go through our link, they give us a little kickback and we greatly appreciate it. The Midnight Black Mass and the Potty Humor Network special event coming up. On October the 10th at 9 p.m. from Ybor City, Florida, the lovely and vicious ladies of Shine 22 will be locking horns. You can view that live on video on demand on www.nlive.com for $9.99 for streaming and $14.99 for streaming live and later video on demand viewing. 
that shine in the eye pay-per-view October the 10th at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. See all of the toughest and most beautiful women in all of professional wrestling do battle. Whether you're having an autograph session, personal appearance, or live event, we got just the person you need to contact for all of those needs. SBI Bookings is home of some of the best stars in the wrestling industry today. They provide you with the best talent this business has to offer, from Kevin Nash, Larry Zbysko, Scott Steiner, and many, many more. So who will you contact next time you're planning an event? The men of SBI Bookings. Check them out at sbibookings.com. Wrestling fans, Anarchy Wrestling Television tapings are the second and fourth Saturdays of every month at 4236 Level Grove Road in Cornelia, Georgia. For more information on Anarchy Wrestling and on the shows to watch the television product and a whole lot more, go to anarchy-wrestling.net. That's Anarchy Wrestling, the second and fourth Saturdays of every month in Cornelia, Georgia. Hey, kids, you know you want to be the coolest cat on the block with your official Midnight Black Mass merchandise. Available at midnightblackmass.spreadshirt.com. Just in time for Halloween, we have brand new Midnight Black Mass t-shirts. We have reject t-shirts. We have beanies. We have hoodies and more over at midnightblackmass.spreadshirt.com. Get your merchandise today and be one of the cool kids. Where can you find 24-7 pro wrestling, MMA, talk radio, and more? BeyondRingside.com Featuring 24-7 streaming audio, including the Midnight Black Mass, Sundays at 11 p.m. Eastern Time, except for pay-per-view weekends when they run a mini-marathon and the Midnight Black Mass goes on as its namesake at midnight. But don't forget the other great shows like Beyond Ringside, Wrestle Rage, to be determined and more. That's beyondringside.com. Hey, kids. Get your official Midnight Black Mass merchandise just in time for Halloween at midnightblackmass.spreadshirt.com. Be the coolest ghoul on the block with your brand new Reject or Midnight Black Mass t shirt. Get them exclusively online. Online exclusive, people. MidnightBlackMass.Spreadshirt.com And we're back on the Midnight Black Mass. My guest at this time is a man who, if you're joining the show and you were familiar with our AJ Styles and, and interviews of that, like you might not be aware of this man, but if you followed my career at NWA Anarchy, I'm sure you are aware of him, at least to a small degree, but you probably don't know just what an impact or influence he had on the overall product and the people that were around him at that time. Uh, he was known as the one-man hair band. He was known as the Wizard of Oz. He was one half of the Hollywood Brunettes, later one of the Devil's Rejects as the Southeastern Strangler, had a wrestling career that spanned from 2001 to 2014 when he lost a retirement match earlier this spring of 2014 to the temptation Sean Tempers at Empire Wrestling. Now serving as a matchmaker, commissioner for Empire Wrestling, and behind the scenes in the role of the booker. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome one of my best friends in the whole world, Mr. Andrew Alexander to the Midnight Black Mass. Man, I can't live up to that introduction. That was something. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's what everybody says and I, I guess I should take that as a compliment right yeah I mean I'm, I'm no household name people are going to be like who is this guy <laughs> I'm just some dude <laughs> well, yeah, well and, and you. certainly to the layman you, you may be but I think to the, the southern wrestling fan especially over the independence over the last decade if you followed the southern indies then um, I think you're going to be in for a real treat as to what Mr. Alexander has to offer. Well, maybe. I mean, first off, let me thank you for having me. This is uh, busting my podcast cherry here, so I hope you'll take it easy on me. 
my first time uh, on a podcast. Uh, let me say something else real quick because I'm sure we're going to get into a lot all things pro wrestling, and I just hate those guys, and I hate to sound like one of those guys. So I'll give the give the fans of your podcast a fair warning. In the overall scheme of pro wrestling and the world we live in, with the WWE reigning as king and things like that, ultimately, I don't know anything. I know so little, like I've never been to the dance, I've never been to the show, you know, I've never had a contract and things such as that. Uh, So I don't want to sound like a know-it-all with anything we get into, but, you know, the thing is, is I've I've spent most of my life uh, as a pro wrestling fan and, and trying to study and learn and things such as that, and, you know, I've heard stories and gotten advice and you know that as as you have as well and i have opinions on stuff and that's all we're gonna we'll share here so if you're like who the hell is this guy i mean nobody really but you know maybe i'll offer some some at least funny insight or maybe some interesting insight i don't know but don't 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 email the rev and complain like who's this know-it-all that we don't even (laughs) we don't even know who he is he's talking like he knows everything (laughs) <laughs> I mean that, that's understandable. I have that concern. Like I, I don't like to. I, when I go on podcasts and they ask me about, you know, what do you think about WWE or this, that, and the other, I really like to steer away from that stuff. You know, keep it to my experience. And you've had a unique experience, so that's what we're going to talk about here tonight on the show. Um, you, you got in back in two thousand and one. It was a unique time in the business. Um, a lot of. What had been the business at that time was drying up, but take us back even further. This is the the initial question I ask everybody, and it's kind of a rewording of the the old how'd you get started question, but it's a little more direct. In my opinion, Uh, I like to ask, what lit your fire when you were a small child? You said you were a lifelong wrestling fan, so I'm assuming it was. What about pro wrestling did you see? What was that moment? that made you go, that's what I want to do? Well, it's it's funny. Uh, initially, at the age of like five, I wasn't a wrestling fan. My my grandfather was, and he would make me watch it on Saturdays. And I, and I hated it, but that didn't, that didn't last very long. I guess maybe I adopted the whole, if you can't beat them, join them. And eventually, I just, I fell in love with it, and it consumed me almost to an unhealthy state. And I mean, I'm sure... There's other people that can relate to that, but I was I was the wrestling guy in you know my school growing up. It's all I talked about. It's all I thought about. It's all I did. Uh, neighborhood kids would sometimes be afraid to come up to the house to like play and stuff because I'd always want to grab them and put them in the sharpshooter or put them in holes and all this stuff. And uh, you know, I always kind of thought about it, but it's like one of those things where you're like, oh, I can't be a professional wrestler, you know, I'm I'm too small or whatever. And then uh, when I was 12 years old in the sixth grade, you start middle school when people kind of start getting on you like, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You need to start getting a plan together. And I didn't have, I had no idea. And I was like, man, I don't, I don't know. I need to think of something. And at the time, uh, it's funny because I know you'll know this, but your listeners don't. But of course, my my hero and my idol was always Bret Hart. Uh, and of course, as a as a fan, the number one enemy is Shawn Michaels. But he kind of had a whole lot to do with lighting that fire, as you called it, because around this time is when he came back and he won the Royal Rumble, and they started the whole a twelve year old boy's dream to be the champion and led into the WrestleMania 12 Ironman match and seeing that build up and seeing that match and then him winning uh and being handed the title I was like I'm I'm going to be a, I'm going to be a pro wrestler that's that's all there is to it and then I I go to school and you know when next time that type of stuff comes up I say that and I remember my history teacher was like you can't do that that's crazy and as soon as she said that it was like well, now that's definitely what I'm going to do because you just said I couldn't, and I never looked back. I never, you know, I never had the backup plan. I never tried to, like, well, maybe I should get an education. I was just, okay, I'm going to be a pro wrestler, which is not smart if anyone's listening to you. That is not how you should approach it. 
No, no, I I too ran off and joined the circus, and um, I, I could have benefited by probably getting an education first or something else. Um, luckily, I ended up, you know, in a, a decent job later on outside of wrestling, uh, and you you know, it, it it all worked out for me. But but certainly, it's not the best idea for you to put all your eggs into that basket. Um, you know, like there's other there's actors and other entertainment professions that would say the opposite i guess there's two schools of thought there the other is like do that or starve and certainly if you do that then um you're either going to make it or starve so you know one of two things but um yeah interesting perspective anyway yeah and uh another thing is is uh the reason i would i didn't become that household name you know is uh a lot of people make excuses and things. I'm not, I'm really, I try to stay away from that. But another thing, if you're wanting to get into pro wrestling, you have no clue the work and the dedication and the time it takes to be at a level to where you can get a job and make a living doing it. Like you, you need to put in 110%. And I, I didn't always do that. You know, part of it starting out was lack of knowledge. You know, I never was a gym guy. I never was a nutrition guy um, in school and stuff. So, you know, when I get started, I didn't have the knowledge to do those things. But instead of just sitting around and waiting, I should have been very proactive and and, and seek knowledge to, to better my, my physique and cardiovascular training and, and all of those things. And by the time I did that, I did do that later on. But I had already been wrestling eight, nine years, and it was kind of uh, uh, almost a too little, too late type deal. I should have been doing that from day one. And you so put your you body through it. a lot of you abuse, too, in those early years. You know, you you really, um, a lot of guys, they, they're trying so hard in those early years of their career to get noticed that they just pull out all the stops. My God, I mean, I remember the night that you broke your toe. <laughs> <laughs> and the the bone was sticking out, um, you know, doing insane things. And then later you learn that you don't have to do that. But unfortunately, some guys have already beat the hell out of their body by the time they do learn it. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's a story. I mean, everybody's heard those stories, but they're true. They're they're all true. I'd been wrestling a month when that happened. And sure, it's just a broken toe. But I mean, good Lord, I didn't have anything when I was get. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And you know, I didn't. I didn't have proper boots, and uh, I did that, and then I just finished the match and uh, come back too early, and it's just you know little things like that. But everybody, you know, pretty much everybody has to go through that. But it's another reason, you know, I should have had boots. I should have been better prepared before I even started actually working matches, which is something you know you hate to see nowadays. Which at a good show you won't see that, but <laughs> that's another story. No. <laughs> No, <laughs> everybody, you know, has their own way of getting in. Uh, some kind of get in the back door and some get in through more legitimate means. But um, the cream always tends to rise to the top, and I I felt you did that. Um, what would you say about Big Wood just momentarily and, and what, you know, the opportunity that he gave you by training you originally and, and helping you out in those early days? Oh, man, he was, he was so great. Uh, I wish... Because the thing was, is when I, when I hit, you know, little TWA in Dalton, which at the time, um, Jimmy Rave was going a lot and he wasn't yet the Ring of Honor and TNA star he became, but he was, uh, he was doing very well at NWA Wildside to where right after I met him, I kind of saw him on TV and was like, oh man, this guy's like, this guy's going to be a big deal, you know, and he, and he was there, you know, in and out. So he kind of worked out a little bit at first, but I kind of embellished how much training I had just to get in the door there because, um, a man by the name of, uh, he wrestles, he still wrestles in the area. I believe his name's Sean rage, but he had a, uh, he had a ring in his front yard and a buddy of mine, uh, who also wrestles in the area by the name of Damian black. He, he told me about it and I was so excited. I couldn't wait, you know, I was 16 and I just got a license and, so we would we would drive, you know, an hour away and train in his front yard, you know, and learn how to bump. You know, I didn't learn a, a lot of stuff, which I shouldn't have. Uh, 
but I learned how to bump and things. But then when I go to TWA, uh, it's like, how, how long have you been training? I was like, oh, I've been training for a year, which was total BS. And I, the only training I'd really had was kind of run the ropes and take some bumps. But then Woody was there, and he was kind of in and out. Uh, you know, some nights he wouldn't be there. But there were other people that would help us, you know, like a Jimmy Rave and Frankie Frank and stuff like that. But when Wood was there, it was just so different. I always learned something. It was just so – he was just so smart about stuff. It's it's so crazy. And, and I've said it before. There's there's nobody in the, the southeast or the Chattanooga, maybe Atlanta area, that whole circle there that has done more for pro wrestling than the Big Wood. If if there is anybody, I would love to hear who. I don't know what argument could be made for anybody, but he 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 was just so smart. He just always could teach you something. He's a real ambassador for the business, and he's always seeking okay. out guys who've been there and done it, and and will, are willing to teach. You know, Ricky Morton is great about that, and he's always bringing him in, and uh, he's always taking time to bring in bigger names and more experienced guys, and that that helps out the whole area. Yeah, definitely. Uh, get it helps get people to the shows, and he, you know, he puts on a good show. He he puts on a lot of shows. He just he just does so much. He's trained guys. He's trained countless guys. There's uh, he probably doesn't even know how many guys he's trained, and 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 even guys he hasn't trained that he would you know later take under his wing and things like that. He's just he's just done so much for. Probably ninety percent of the wrestlers in in this area in Georgia and Tennessee, part of Alabama. Yeah, yeah, I, absolutely. So you get in through the the TWA and the Big Wood, and you start going around doing some area shows. Um, this one man hair band stick, which um, was very popular with lots of promoters actually, because it was just quite entertaining. Uh, you'd come out and say the wrong name of the town and you know, do some silly shtick before the match. And, um, you know, in some places, like, you started out doing a lot of crazy stuff. But, of course, you in some places it kind of went to a comedy thing. But a place that where it was kind of a mixture of both, and you really were one of the top guys there, was a place that got a little bit of buzz for a while, actually, all over the Internet and stuff, was uh, NAWA in Rome, Georgia. And um, just, I, I know there are some listeners out there that actually followed that. Um, there was a brief period where... When wild side tape trading was big, the NAWA was kind of uh, fed off of that, and so there was actually some some tape trading going on at some of those those shows. So uh, just a little bit about that experience and that that whole early part of your career as the one man hair band, and why you got away from it. Man, that that part that show was so good at the time, man. It was just so uh, it, it was real different. Uh, it, when when people say to young wrestlers, you know, you need to wrestle on different shows to learn stuff, it's so true because I, you know, I would go from TWA to some of the local shows in the area, and I would always learn different things. Sometimes you learn what not to do, which is just as important as learning what to do. Uh, and that Rome show in AWA, that was kind of the first time I broke out of my comfort zone. Like the first night I went, I went by myself, and I didn't know anybody down there. Uh, I think I think at the time Drew Delight, who is the owner of uh, uh, Empire Pro Wrestling, uh, he's he kind of uh, told, invited me, and I think he was there the first night. But then the the next week when I went to just kind of work out in the ring, he he didn't go, and I went by myself. And it was you know it was a little it was a little intimidating at the time I was eighteen, and uh, I'd started doing the the hairband gimmick and. Uh, if people saw Jimmy Rave do it in TNA, it was uh, it, picture that. But uh, no disrespect to Jimmy, but I think I did a little bit of a better job because, you know, especially back then. But even even now, I'm just I'm a sucker for those those bands, Dawkins, Motley Crue, Poison. You know, that's that's my favorite stuff. And I just it just hit me one day. I was like, I'm just gonna do this, and I wore the craziest clothes i bought so many women's clothes it's not even funny uh, i would wear thongs on the outside of my tights like david lee ross and i would choke guys with them behind the rest back and just just ridiculous outlandish stuff like you said and then it was kind of it was a popular thing for sure and um i did that for a while there and it, 
I got away I got away from it and people just thought I was crazy because I wanted to focus I was focusing way I was depending on it as a crutch. I was focusing way too much on I've got this character, I need to focus on what I'm gonna say and what I'm gonna wear. And I would focus on the matches but you know, I wasn't focused on really getting better and stepping up and, you know, really trying to do some get a better look and change my body and things such as that. So I just completely got away with, away from it and just did basically just kind of started over and did something else, which I, I've never regretted. I mean, it was it was a ton of fun. It was so much fun, and it helped me, you know, get you know get some bookings here and there and things like that. But eventually, I just had to do try something a little a little more serious just to focus on actually. Uh, learning, learning psychology, learning how to put matches together, things such as that, you know, the important stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think it's good advice for guys in the indies as well because, um, as we all well know, you know, you, you can claim copyright or ownership of any of this stuff that you do on the indies, but um, all someone else has to do is take it and tweak it a little bit and do it somewhere else in front of a whole lot more people, and then all of a sudden you look like the imitator. So you really, I mean, it's good to have the gimmick. I, as I, I wouldn't have had any sort of managerial career without one. But you also <laughs> need to, to to have the other side taken care of as well, so you can be adaptable and shift. And that's a recurring theme that guys keep mentioning um, from the top of the business all the way down. Is you know, it's it's very important to be flexible and adaptable. Yeah, definitely. And and what you say about people do like when. Uh, Jimmy Bill Barons had seen me do the gimmick, and he kind of um, they were looking for something for Jimmy to do or something like that, and he kind of suggested it. They ran with it. You know, I never had any heat about that because I'd stopped doing it for years, and I, you know, of course I thought it was kind of cool. I was like, well, this is this is blatantly, you know, an idea that I was doing, and he's out there making a name and making a little money for it. So at least I had a good idea, and and Jimmy was always cool. He came up to me like, hey man, they just suggested it. I said that you know it's no problem at all. Uh, so so that was that was actually kind of cool saying like okay well I've had I had an idea that it is least at least a little valuable just because it's on national television now so you know yeah like the kind fact of a, that he came a to you to that. get your okay was like, <laughs> he came to, okay oh, yeah. well you know he, he came to you to get your okay so you'd be cool with that. Yeah, I mean, and he's and he didn't have to do that. He's Jimmy Ray, but at that point he'd been to I'm sure Japan, all over the world, Ring of Honor. You know, he could have just been like, well, screw that guy. But he was he was class act about it. He was a, he was a cool guy about it and stuff. So I was all cool with it. Yeah. So you moved along from from there to tag team wrestling, and you had a pretty good run as a tag team with Kyle Matthews as the Hollywood Brunettes. Um, just so we make sure, um, I, I'm guaranteeing that we're coming back for part two next week because I can already tell we're going to run long here. Um, but we, we've got, let's see, we've got about 25 minutes left in the recording time. So, um, but I, I do want to have you talk a moment about the time with Kyle because obviously Kyle Matthews um, went on to, to become a protege of Ted Allen, uh, just one of the great natural talents around and. If he ends up ending his career without making some sort of substantial living in wrestling, it'll be a crime. Uh, but you two also had a hell of a run as a tag team, as the Hollywood Brunettes. And um, what sort of shifted you into that role? You care to talk about that a little bit? I don't know. Uh, I, I'd started. I, I was. I was focused on wrestling. I, you know, I was getting there. I wasn't as focused as I should have been, but I, I was definitely you know, trying, I was trying to improve and, uh, trying to focus on the right stuff. And it's one of those stories where it's just like when things just click, things just work, you know, I didn't even know Kyle and, uh, murder one who was running the show at the time was said, Hey, I I think I want you guys to team up tonight. And he just pointed to this kid and he had this, I think at the time he had this ridiculous pink fuzzy hat and he was like 140 pounds soaking wet. And I was like, I mean, all right, cool. Uh, and it was just funny because he's like, well, what should we come out to? And I said, you know, I've always loved the Hollywood Blondes old WCW theme music, and they used it for jobbers. So I was like, you know, most people won't recognize it. It's like, let's use it. And 
was somebody, maybe it was me, maybe it was him, I can't remember, but I, I think my, maybe I was just chuckled. I was like, we should be the Hollywood brunette. And we teamed up one night, and it was just, it was good. And Murder One was, I'm going to keep you guys as a team. And boom, we're just off to the races. And we we, we did have a good run as a team, but it's so it's so funny that if we were, if if Kyle was the wrestler that he became after kind of learning under Ted Allen, and I was the wrestler that I became just later through knowledge and and, and it's so weird because I retired in April and I never planned to wrestle a match again but it just focusing in all the matches as being a booker I feel that I'm a better wrestler now than I was then like I you just learn so much and when you're griping at guys about stuff it about what they're doing wrong or what they're doing right it kind of triggers stuff in your mind and it's just so it's just so weird that if we if we had done that team Five years later, I, I think I think we would have we would have been really successful. Um, I think we could have been because obviously Kyle's become, you know, arguably the best wrestler in Georgia, arguably the Southeast. Um, and I brought a little more of the a little more of the personality and some of, some of the things like that to the team. But I think we would have been really good. Oh, I mean Kyle like said because we did. I'm sorry. Oh, Kyle said it himself on this show. You know that that you brought more well, the personality, and uh, uh, he brought the technical wrestling. But as a team, it was just this perfect blend. Yeah, it really was. I was. Um, I look back on it, and it's just you know, and, and you were there. You you were managing me. Uh, um, maybe six weeks before I had my last match, we kind of did a random tag where me and him got to team again against uh, Sean Tempers and Johnny Viper and Empire. And we hadn't teamed in it's got to be four or five years, and it was just so it was so fluid, it was so smooth. Guys in the back were like, "It looks like y'all team every week, and y'all have it in years." I mean, we just it just worked well together. It just always did. And you know, like I said, if we if we had if we were stuck together, or if we just had the knowledge and teamed later, we I mean, we could have been a force to be reckoned with in tag team wrestling. And you know, I'm not trying to sound too talky or arrogant, but we, we would have been good. We would have been really good, is what I mean to say. Right, right, right. Yeah, I'm not, not trying to suck your own dick here, but, you know, yeah. we, we could have been good. Uh, well, somebody, <laughs> hey, somebody's got to suck it. <laughs> <laughs> right. I just felt the show hadn't been vulgar at all, and, you know, I, I put a warning on this thing for a reason, so I had to say something offensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I usually maybe, maybe on part two, maybe you'll get me because I'm sure you want me to rant about wrestling today and some different things like that, and I can go off. You may need a part three or part four, but I'm sure we'll get a little longer. <laughs> okay, oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> but the, so, uh, one uh, thing I, I want to say, one thing I want to say about Kyle, just in hopes of. You know, there's other there's other wrestlers, especially in this area, probably that I know listening. Kyle's like he's just regarded by everyone, by fans, by the boys, by bookers, owners. Everyone's like he's the best wrestler, and I kind of know the secret behind it. It's not like Kyle has so much knowledge he never gets tired which is a huge huge thing he's a cardio machine even though he does no cardio he just wrestles he's just naturally uh, he's like a robot basically a wrestling robot but he never gets tired you know he's in he's in good shape he's a little small but he still looks like an athlete and he, all of it and he has the this presence and all of his moves look good and all that but that's not what really makes him the best in my mind like people don't understand that Kyle's one of these guys that if he shows up to a show and someone if he was booked to wrestle Jimmy Rave and he gets there and they're like we want you to wrestle Joe Schmo he just says okay cool he doesn't complain he doesn't whine he goes out there and he still has arguably the best match on the card with some guy that has no business even being in the ring with him. And he can do that all the time and he's flexible and he could work with different guys. But that's part of what makes him the best is he, his attitude. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't hear something like that and just goes, okay, well, and just go out there and be lazy and just kind of phone it in. And you know, as well as I do that guys will do that constantly. <laughs> 
So there's so there's a secret if anybody you know that's my opinion if if there was anybody who's like why can't I be as good as Kyle Matthews that's one of the reasons why is because you don't you don't show up ready to work anybody and to have the best match with the with the proper attitude and things such as that because you know how many guys do we know that are really 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 good that are athletes and look great and they're smart and have the moves but. It's still there's something that they don't get mentioned in that that conversation with Kyle Matthews. I think that's what sets it apart. I I think you're exactly right. You know, the guys that put in the effort and the time are usually not the ones talking about it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, the exactly. You'll never hear Kyle say, I'm the best wrestler, you know. That's another thing. But no, everyone else will say it for him. Exactly. So you uh, you wrapped up the thing with Kyle. He he kind of went on to train with Ted Allen, and um, you had the entourage in, in Anarchy and a little bit of a run there. Uh, and then you, you started under the rejects, and, and that was a fun period. Well, actually, even before that, you, you crafted that Southeastern Strangler deal. And so, so basically, you've taken your, your gimmick into a whole other direction again. You you done the tag team thing and you kind of branched out and you kept that personality into the entourage and that stuff. And then um, as we started in WH Chattanooga, you, you developed this this southeastern strangler persona. Uh, so it, it was it just another attempt to try to evolve and stay fresh. Uh, yes, and it was a it was kind of an attempt at. After the entourage, because at that point, NWA Anarchy, when me and Kyle's thing was over, that was when, you know, I took I took that Les Thatcher training seminar, which he does a lot of those. And if you don't go to those, you're doing yourself a disservice because I took that and it was just like something else clicked. And that's when I really – that's the point where I got my butt in gear and I was, I was living in the gym. I was training with, coincidentally, Sean Tempers. Uh, which he was looking great at the time too, and I was I was eating right, and I, I was just really killing myself. But I, I got the results, and I was like, okay, this is what I should have been doing five, six, seven, eight years ago. But you know, that's when I really stepped it up, and you know, I didn't. Not only was it extremely difficult and extremely financially straining um, with the, the proper food and things such as that, because that's a full time job. When you look like that, when people look like that, they don't understand. Other people don't understand that. That takes it's so much work. It's crazy. It's not like these guys go to a gym for an hour and they look like, you know, Gunner on TNA, which you know feel shattered. You know, like those guys are insane. <laughs> it's insane. It's insane to look like that. Uh, so anyone that does has my respect, but. You know, after doing that, I did it for a while, and I was still, I was still struggling a little bit with, with where to go in wrestling, and some things happened, and it was just kind of, you know, I kind of just kind of accepted, you know, getting getting the job, main eventing WrestleMania, being the world champion. That's a one, and you know, a million thing. And I look at myself and I looked at my peers and I looked at other guys that didn't have jobs that, you know, should have. And I just got, I just faced reality. I was just like, you know, I don't think this is for me. I think I should put my focus on something else. Well, which still took me several years to actually do because I still, I did still love it, but, you know, it wasn't going to, I didn't want it to be my main focus. It still kind of was, but. You know, so I left NWA Anarchy because because of that, and you know that's not a place where you should go to play wrestler. NWA Anarchy is a place where you should go to truly want to learn and grow and have opportunities and doors open for you. And that's not what I was trying anymore, and I wanted to give a spot to someone else. So I did, and so the Southeastern Strangler, I, it was just let me. I want to do something fun. I want to do something different. And I had discovered the show Criminal Minds. And I just got hooked on it, and there was a, you know, one of the biggest, uh, biggest killers on that show was the Boston, the Boston Reaper, uh, played by uh, C. Thomas Howe, uh, Pony Boy. <laughs> Fucking <laughs> Pony Outsiders. Boy. 
Yeah, yeah. He just did, but he did an amazing job, and he had this black hood, and he had this solid black mask. And I just saw it one day, and I said, "I want to do that." So I started. I just started researching sociopaths, and I'm reading all this stuff, and I'm trying to learn. I'm learning what makes them what makes them sociopaths and just, I just did it to do something different and just have a little fun with it. Cause I was still wrestling, you know, I, 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 my heart wasn't into it as much as it should have been, but you know, you, uh, you and some other people were started in WA Chattanooga and you asked me to be a part of it. And, you know, I wasn't going to tell y'all no. And you know, it was, it was fun. NWA Chattanooga was great. Like the fact that it didn't like that. It's still not going is a shame because, you know, we did some really good stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I started doing that, and I really put a lot of effort into it, you know, and tried, but it was just something fun to do, which evolved to you becoming my manager and, you know, doing Devil's Rejects thing uh, at Empire, which also was, you know, tons of fun. And we did some really good stuff with that, too, I think. Oh, yeah. I I really hate that. I, that was another thing I'd regretted, and we, of course, had this conversation privately before, but I I regret that I didn't get to manage you longer, like, in the rejects, because, um, you know, we had some great runs in, like, in Alabama, and a little short deal in Nashville up there with seven, and, uh, of course, in Georgia, several different places. So, you know, and it, it always seemed to to work, especially for like a six months to a year period, you know, we could come in and pop a territory and, um, and I'll have a hell of a time and get a ton of heat in these small towns that had never seen this, uh, demonic, you know, uh, these people that, that sold it hard as well. You know, it, it, we weren't some clowns playing around at this devil business. Um, <laughs> we, people believed it. I, I remember in Athens, Tennessee, one time, I, this lady had a seizure at, at a show. Uh, I didn't mean, I didn't mean to scare her that bad, but she did. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's another in Dayton, Tennessee, I think, where this kid got so scared he turned around and just puked on his mama. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So it was legit. It would have been great to have you around during that. Um, but, you know, it, it, it didn't happen, but it did. I'm very thankful for the time we got to spend uh, because it, it was, it was a lot of fun, boy. They hated us for a while, and then at any place that we stuck around long enough, they hated us, and then eventually they loved us, and we got to have the whole run there. And um, you moved on into the administrative role, and I moved kind of back into the announcer seat, which is kind of cool for me since that's sort of where I made my name. And um, so talk now uh, just about, uh, after retirement, life after wrestling a little bit, um, you transition into the role of a booker. Uh, you know, I, I hate to even talk about that on the air. I know you're hesitant to, given how we were taught the business. But, you know, in, in this world, um, it's hardcore fans that are listening, A, and B, it, if you're not, then people just think you're trying to insult them. So you're kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't. So we might as well be fucking honest about it. Yeah, I don't like to. I don't like to advertise, and I, I mean, I could have. I could have went forever without it even coming out that I was the booker at Empire. Uh, you know, and it's a little bit easier now because I'm in that role as you know the the authority figure on the show. You know, as the commissioner. So when I say I've made this match, you, you know, it's true. <laughs> I really did make the match. So it's kind of easier to get away with now, but. Uh, yeah, you know, because I started, I started booking because I always wanted to book, and I'd always been, you know, even going back to my first year in the business, you know, I would, I would be allowed to secretly book some stuff on a show, and, and uh, when you were booking Anarchy, you know, I, I, you would ask me because I was living with you at the time, and you were asking me for a lot of ideas, and you know, I'd give you some ideas, and you'd be like, yeah, that's really good, you know, and there was just lots of time, and when uh. There was a time when someone was booking at Anarchy, and there was a transition, and they were asking me for tons of ideas, and a lot of stuff wasn't going well at the time there. Um, you know, to nobody's fault, it was just because, you know, th that Cornelia wrestling, you know, it's been there a long time, and it just it has a lot of up and ups and downs, like any any wrestling show does. But oh yeah, any any stationary yeah. uh, 
product is going to have its peaks and valleys. And, I mean, what the fuck hadn't they seen in Cornelia at that point? Exactly. Exactly. You know, they've seen everything. So it's so hard. It's so difficult. And, you know, I'd, I'd, I've been asked a lot of ideas there. And, uh, you know, there was a transition in the booking. And it just kind of dawned on me. And I didn't want to say anything, but I was like, you know, maybe they'll ask me to be the booker. And then some of the boys are like, hey, I think they're going to ask you to be the booker. And I and I was like, man, I can't believe this because, man, with those tools there, with the talent that has always been in and out of that building and the your, your video screen, which we, which we have at Empire, and, you know, it's TV and all that stuff. I was like, man, I could just – I could try to do so much. I just really want to try. I really want to try. And then they uh, they announced the booker, and it was uh, Jerry Palmer who was owning it. He said, I'm going to book. And literally, you know, I remember Stephen Walters, who's NXT talent, Dash Wilder now, he was he was standing off to the side, and he just <laughs> looked at me and locked eyes and, like, shook his head and put his head down because <laughs> he was like, man, I hope they let you do it. I hope they let you do it. Uh, and I was so excited. I was like, man, that I can't even believe it because, you know, other guys, without me saying anything, are like, I think, I think they're going to let you. I think they're going to let you. So I always wanted to book. I just always wanted to be the booker and just to see if I could do it, to see if I could put stuff together, help guys grow and things like that. You know, and uh, Drew Delight gave me the chance to book Empire, and it was, uh, yeah, had a lot of potential, but it was struggling. It wasn't what he wanted it to be, you know, rightfully so. Not to say that it is now, but it's definitely gone in the right direction in the past three plus years. Um, and he asked me, and I just came in, and, you know, I've had lots of help. Have, you know, you and Tank and, you know, tons of other guys. I won't go into everybody. I've had tons of help doing it, but, um, I've, I've, I enjoy booking more than I did actually wrestling and competing in the ring. I, I feel I'm better at it than I actually was in the ring. Um, I, I think I've done a good job, you know. Could I have done stuff differently and better? Of course. Uh, and I'm sure there will be times I'm, you know, I'm making mistakes and things like that. But just overall, I've been, I've been really happy with it. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, the fans have been and, you know, some of the wrestlers, uh, if not, you know, that's their problem. But, uh, you know, I just wanted to, you know, sometimes I get bitter about it and I'm like, you know, screw it. But, you know, deep down, I want wrestling in this area that has gotten a bad rap for years. You know, I want wrestling in this area to, to go on and, and be strong and for people to know that, you know, this is a show you can go to and it's a good show. And this guy, that this wrestler, he's good. This wrestler's good, you know. Um, it just seemed that the the area kind of stopped producing, you know, some good talent there for a while. And I just wanted. Yeah. Well, you don't want to go to a card where they look like the whole guys, like you said earlier, look like they're playing wrestler. Um, you you want to see guys that look like they're serious and that they take themselves seriously and they take the business seriously and and they treat the material with respect, so to speak. And not everything is fucking jive ass and, yeah, you can you can go out there and have fun, but if you're going out there, I don't I don't think you should go out there just to have fun. You can't go out there and just completely dick around. Uh, playing wrestler, nothing wrong with it. If you want to go to uh, a, a shit show in the area and you want to wrestle and your family's there and whatever and you want to goof off, hey, that's on you. That's cool. I don't, I got no problem with that, but um, you know that. <laughs> That kind of when you get that a lot, which you do, it gives wrestling a bad name. And then when people hear a pro wrestling, they're like, "Oh God, it's like that," you know. And and I'm not crazy. Empire, it's a good show, but it's not. It's not the WWE. We don't have pyro and extremely bright lights, and we have technical difficulties, and we have guys that not all of our guys have six pack abs and things like that, but. You know, we I want to be the best show absolutely possible. I want I want the building to come across as, you know, as clean as can be for what we have and the, the ring and the stage and the setup and the, the video screen and the vignettes, the talent, all of it. I want it to be as close to a televised product as we can get on extremely limited budget and, you know, extremely limited everything. And I And I think we've done that, you know, I think. I think if people really pay attention and they watch Monday Night Raw 
or SmackDown, and then they come to Empire, they're like, you know, this is kind of like what I see on TV. You know, that's what I go for. So, I mean, hopefully it comes across. Yeah, at least, you know, in in the respect of professional presentation, um, you yeah. know, you you present a, a much more wrestling-centric product, but you certainly, you, you keep it uh, familiar to those who might be be watching the uh, the only game in town, really. So, I mean, they, they set the tone for what everybody does. But, look, we got like three minutes left on this week's part of the recording. Um, I, we're going to continue this conversation about booking, actually, on part two because um, I really want to, like, get into to deep discussion about philosophies and preferences. And um, I, I can actually go into some detail about my time booking Anarchy and how that was a little bit more difficult than I thought it was going to be um, just due to me kind of underestimating the situation, but um, definitely, you know, in comparison to how you handle things now. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, and I, and I can, you know, I never got to, I never got to book that show, and I can't imagine because it's just, you know, it's a different ball game. It's been established, like you said, the fans have seen stuff, and they have a whole different crew of guys, and they have a rob, kind of a, revolving door there you know there's always talent leaving always talent coming in um so you know hats off to you know todd sexton and bill barons because they've done that gig for quite a while and uh they haven't gone crazy <laughs> no no they always manage to reinvent it you know like that's, that's yeah. a real testament to, to their talent yeah definitely you know it may not always be you may to look back at an angle, oh, this angle's not as good as that one in 2007 and stuff like that. But, I mean, you know, that's wrestling. You know, you, gotta, you, can't, you can't just do the, the one angle that works. You just can't keep redoing it over and over. you got to just do new stuff and just hope, it, hope it's as good as – I hope the fans aren't let down by it, you know. So, yeah, booking, booking is uh, – that, it's tough. <laughs> it is we're going to talk more about how tough it is next week but we're out of time fans this week with andrew alexander we'll be back for part two next week thanks for joining us man and i can't wait till the next one all right man thank you all right see you then all right this has been the midnight black mass thank you for listening this is the reverend keep one foot in the gutter and one fist in the gold i'm out